how I went from making less than 20 grand a year to over $200,000. When I was young, I paid most of my bills from working in construction. I even cleaned apartments and toilets. I did night shifts as a freelance translation proofreader, which meant I wasn't even doing the translation myself. And with what I'm sharing today, there was no windfall, no lucky quick scheme, no pretense, fake it till you make it. There were a couple of really important and good decisions that lifted me out of just scraping by to hitting the highest tax bracket a few years later. I'll walk you through the four core pillars that were instrumental for that transformation. And when I say transformation, you have to imagine that I would walk past a homeless person and I would feel that I had more in common with that person than with a suit. That was my baseline. It had everything to do with how I saw myself, whether that was instilled by others or not. I did not take myself seriously, or better, I did not see the real world value in myself. If you were to characterize me from early on, I've always been curious about how things worked and whether I could adopt a skill to meddle in that particular field. That's how I got into audio production and then did short stints in broadcasting, how I got into video production specifically for the web, which then led me to building websites for small businesses, developing flash modules, even partnering with content delivery networks to pioneer web-based video recording before there was available on YouTube or Facebook. The biggest pushback I got was nobody will want to record themselves and put it out there. Yes! Yeah, sure, no one. And getting into technology and actually developing some of these, as I think back today, pretty novel ideas gave me a very broad and practical skill set, even though I didn't really know what to do with that. There was no continuity, there was no plan. But nevertheless, that's the first pillar, skills. Be good at something, not just in theory, but with some proof to show, even if that hasn't been monetized yet. Good intentions or attitude isn't enough. You can't go around and say, I will get into, or it's not a problem for me to get into X. And the key is that your skills need to be transferable. My curiosity and trying to do things differently also meant that I wasn't one to easily conform. And if you don't conform, then others, the majority, may perceive you as a risk because they don't know where to put you and whether you're going to stay there. It's about reliability. Can I rely on you? Let's pick up that thought from earlier about believing in yourself. Now the second pillar is the people in your life. Out of 100 people you meet, there will be a handful, so that's one in 20, who look at you differently, who see you in a different light. And if down the road you were to come to them with a concrete ask, and if they happen to be connected or have themselves a need, then they will help you. And that's how I got into my first long-term corporate real job. Because my university buddy Mark, who was also my roommate for a year, eight years before that, he knew how I ticked, he understood my skill set, and he could see the value I could bring to the company that he worked for at the time. So this is not me saying you need to cultivate a network or constantly promote yourself in some humble but proud BS messaging, but you need to nurture relationships with good people in your life, which includes peers who are somewhat in the same field, in the same stage, or slightly ahead of you share the same interests, etc. You need people who see you for who you are and who you could be, even if you don't necessarily see yourself like this. Thirdly, and vouching for you in a different way is leverage. You need leverage. And leverage refers to having something that someone else values to the extent that they're willing to give you something for it. In this context, it actually served as a security. The only reason why I could afford to go to a top tier MBA school was because I could take out a loan against the apartment my girlfriend and I bought some seven years earlier. The fact that we stopped paying rent, which is essentially money going down the drain, and instead had some of the same monthly cost go towards the principal, basically for savings, meant we had capital locked in that small property of ours, which then allowed us to borrow against it. We could take the bet of upskilling and coming out of the $100,000 MBA program with the anticipation that it would open doors and thereby increase our market value and our compensation. And if I think about it, we basically financed a $100,000 MBA with what was a $25,000 down payment on a flat a few years prior, thanks to appreciation as well. Down the road, it gave us a runway. And I recognize that interest rates are shit right now, so this isn't the best time to buy a property. But first, it won't always be like that. 
And second, with the market for mortgages cooling down, so are house prices. Alternatively, you can do this forward looking, where you take out a loan with the understanding that your compensation post MBA will be higher. There are organizations like Prodigy Finance who get that specifically for an MBA. And also, it doesn't have to be an MBA. You can take on other bets, such as starting your own business, for example. The point is about leverage, something that you have that someone else values and you can take advantage of that. Leverage, start building it now. The fourth pillar that allowed me to 10X my income was Yes, the choice of doing a top tier MBA. I'd call this adhering to and taking advantage of established systems and norms. It is much harder to convince people, especially those who don't know you, of yourself versus norms they're already bought into. And just to say this upfront, I have never been academically gifted. And most of the time, I didn't like going to school. And this disconnect went in a few instances as far as the schools I went to telling my parents that I was mentally retarded, that I should have gone to a special needs school. And aside from those blips, my grades were average at best, unless I got really into it, when, uh, which then saw my grades skyrocket. So this wasn't me looking out for my next academic hiatus for the sake of it, but an MBA, more than conveying practical knowledge, serves as a filter mechanism. Can you pass a general set of testing criteria? Can you work with other like-minded people? Will you finish something? How do you perform under pressure? Can you learn stuff fast? Do you, yes, understand the basics of how a business ought to run? Just reading the balance sheet there is helpful or understanding the importance of cash flow, even if your company is, for the most part, not even profitable for 20 years running. Hello, Amazon. And then, can you employ your uniqueness, your creative way of problem solving in the context of a business. That's what coming out of doing an MBA did for me. Where the program acts as a norm and then employers across the board understand that and attribute value to that. You could totally do this without an MBA or a master's or whichever pseudo designation you could pick up. But employers assign a risk profile to someone coming from the left or coming from the right directionally. And if it's the same two people either way, but the risk profile for one variant is lower than for the other, then they're willing to pay a higher price for the one with a lower risk profile because there is a greater assurance or confidence for what they're going to get. So in summary, I went from having a decent skill set, but no real plan for actually employing that, to someone taking a chance on me, believing in me, creating structure around my experience and expertise moving forward then. At the same time, I made choices around accumulating assets which could later be used as a security or as leverage to open the door to a super expensive qualifier, which in my case was an MBA, which by the way, definitely took a few years to afterward to pay off. And that MBA acted as a multiplier for me and was regarded by employers as an established norm for individuals being worth an annual compensation of 200k or more. For me, because I was in London, it was actually 134,000 pounds to be exact. So in each instance, it actually came down to what unlocks the potential in me that hasn't been realized yet. Skills in the right context, people who believe in you, assets to unlock doors, and tapping into norms and systems that attribute a higher value to your work, which means you should continue building up that potential and then hone in on the ways that could unlock it. Hopefully, with a low perceived risk by those around you. And that's how it worked for me. I hope this was helpful. If it was, will you please like and subscribe? Maybe leave a thumbs up in the comment section. And if you need any help, any advice, any guidance, something I could remotely help with, find me on LinkedIn, reach out, and we'll have a chat. Thanks for watching.